All right, it's questions time. Your questions, my answered. As always, wherever you are on the YouTube channel, if you a question pops into your brain, go ahead, type it in. I usually try to answer them all there, but also I like to grab up a bunch of them and answer them right here. So let's get started. Neuron. F. Kane, please explain us how humans passed the Van Allen's belt. I guess you're asking about how the Apollo astronauts got past the Van Allen belt. The Van Allen belt, of course, is this sort of belt of radiation that surrounds the Earth. It comes from the Earth's magnetosphere and its interaction with the solar wind. And it's a very, you know, it's a place of high radiation. And in order to get to the moon or out into space, you need to get away from it. Now, to get to the moon, there's a bunch of things that NASA did. One, they picked a trajectory that took them through sort of less of the Van Allen belt, so less of a radiation exposure. They go fast, right? They go as fast as they can so that the amount of time that's spent in the Van Allen belt is as short as possible. They provide some level of shielding, not a lot. And they hope that there's not like a high degree of solar activity that's going to cause problems for the astronauts. And the astronauts themselves were they understood that they were going to experience a higher level than normal uh, radiation exposure when they, when they make this journey. And this is sort of one of the many brave things that astronauts do. The more we launch humans into space, the more we're going to have to learn to deal with this Van Allen belt. And we're going to do a whole video just on kind of on radiation in space and what we can do to prevent and minimize it. So it's a problem. It's one of the biggest problems of space flight and it's something that we're going to have to figure out how to deal with. Colin M. Hi, Mr. Kane. Just found your channel. Love your enthusiasm. Same as your podcast with Dr. Pamela Gay. Your standards of content are captivatingly high. Don't know how you have time for all your work. Thanks. Okay, so that's not exactly a question, but I thought I would uh, throw that in anyway, just to shamelessly self-promote the other projects that I work on. And the main one is Astronomy Cast, this podcast, long-running podcast I've been doing with Dr. Pamela Gay. We've been doing this for 10 years. We just wrapped up season 10. So if you are kind of enjoying this space thing and you want more of it, I highly recommend you go and check out Astronomy Cast. You can get it where all good podcasts are found. Dr. Pamela Gay is a fount of knowledge. I've learned a ton of my space knowledge from her and a lot of the sort of the rabbit holes that we go down on this show, they came from Astronomy Cast. So if you want to go in a whole other area, find lots more space content, check out Astronomy Cast. Gregalius Marcinocus. Bit out of context here, question about brown dwarfs. If you were to introduce more mass in form of heavier elements into a brown dwarf, then could it start fusing its hydrogen and turn into a real star? Absolutely. The, the whole point of what a brown dwarf is, is it's just an accumulation of hydrogen and helium that is not enough to hit that main sequence phase, the red dwarf phase. You need about 77 times the mass of Jupiter in pile of hydrogen form to make a star. And once you've got that, then there's enough pressure and temperature at the core for you to be able to get fusion of hydrogen into helium. And so if you took a couple of brown dwarfs, smashed them together, you might hit that minimum level of mass to have a star. To keep fly. I wonder how Dr. Greer would respond to this video lol. Okay, so that comment was in response to a video that I did about why I don't believe in aliens and sort of saying that, that you know, there's people out there on the internet who believe that we have, uh, that aliens are visiting us and they have warp drives and secrets are being held by the government and blah, 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 right? And so all these conspiracy theories. And in general, I don't believe in conspiracy theories, right? Like I think that conspiracies, conspiracies are literally impossible to, to keep. And I also believe that conspiracy theories seem to pop up, like literally, am I outside right now is a conspiracy theory, right? People think I'm using a blue screen. So the point is like people will come up with, with conspiracy theories all the time. And uh, there's, you know, two people can't keep a secret, not to mention hundreds of thousands. So I don't think that there's secret technology from aliens, etc., that's being hidden. But, but even so, right, let's imagine, let's, let's say, let's imagine that yes, indeed, there's super secret alien technology and it's hidden in some bunker in the middle of, of, of the Nevada desert and the government is secretly hiding it for some reason. So then what, right? What are you going to do, right? Are you going to 
you know, you can try to like nag the government to release the secret information, which, you know, people have been trying to do for decades and government keeps saying we don't have anything and all of the physics and astronomy people say this stuff is impossible, but people seem to think it's real. Or you just, you know, fine, if you think it's there, fine, but then until then, work on your plan B, which is rockets, reusable rockets, uh, you know, uh, environmentally conscious methods of producing energy, solar panels, like all the technology that, we, that seems to work. And then maybe down the road when all that's been rendered obsolete and the, and the government finally shows us their warp drive, then, you know, you, you call their bluff. Nicely done. And so I guess my feeling is like, if it's a secret and nobody will admit to it, then, then you might as well just pretend like it's not real, right? So that's my, that is my, my stock answer for all the stuff. I, I, you know, I have no way to find out what secrets are being kept from us. So until then, I'm just going to assume that the public information that we have is all we got. And let's just work with that. And don't worry about what's being kept secret from you. Because it's probably not, right? It's probably all just real. What we know is what is possible. And what we don't know, we haven't figured out yet. And that's literally everything there is. Darth Mortis. You made a slight mistake on your Dyson Sphere question. It's not so much that we can't capture all the energy of a star and prevent it from escaping, although I'm sure reaching anywhere near 100% efficiency would be a challenge, but the problem is overheating. Energy can't be destroyed or created, and energy equals heat. So the same holds for that. Keeping all that heat trapped would get everyone in the sphere cooked, and rather quickly. And that is why heat has to be released and why a Dyson can't hide. Man, that was a perfect answer. And that's, I, that was what I was trying to get at, but you're exactly right. That if you are going to trap all of the energy, like imagine you've got this star at the middle, you've got this Dyson cloud that is surrounding the star at the middle, or maybe a Dyson sphere, and the star is putting out all of that energy, and then you're capturing it on the surface of your, the internal surface of your Dyson sphere. You then have to get that temperature out, or you're just going to heat up and heat up and heat up and heat up until you're thousands of degrees and millions of degrees, and everything is cooked. So the only way you do that is you vent that heat out. And this is a big problem for space. You know, you can't use conduction or convection in space. You have to use radiation. You have to get that, that heat off of your spacecraft and, and radiate it away into space. And the same thing goes for your Dyson sphere. So this is exactly why we would see them, because we would see them venting off their heat. And unless they can break the laws of physics, there's no way to stop that from happening. FMMK, I'm one of your Patreon users. Please answer this. Can we introduce fish or some other Earth-based life on Europa's oceans? First, thank you for being a patron. Wise move. We really appreciate it. Second, could we put fish and other stuff into Europa? I mean, obviously there are enormous ethical problems for us introducing Earth-based species into Europa. So let's assume that Europa or Enceladus, we've, we've definitively proven that there is no life there. Could we introduce our own Earth-based life? Well, what it seems to be happening is that you've got this, you know, this planet toy, this moon. You've got some kind of icy water. You've got a water around it and then some shell that's formed because of the coldness of space. And then you've got some kind of volcanism that is happening at the bottom of these oceans, these hydrothermal vents, which are releasing uh, hydrogen into the water and that's coming out through the vents on the moon and out into space. That environment on Earth is like the perfect place for life. We have these hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the oceans that have all kinds of, of you know, these black smokers and they have all this life surrounding them. Uh, microbial life, lots of different kinds of bacteria, and then dis different kinds of shrimp, and then fish, and this whole big rich ecosystem. Now, could you then take our sort of hydrothermal loving bacteria and put them onto Europa and Enceladus? Maybe, probably, I mean, unless there's something else poisonous in the, in the ocean, but we find here on Earth, wherever there's water, liquid water, there's life. So it feels fairly reasonable to me that we could do that, and then we could build up an ecosystem on top of that with the shrimp and things like that. 
fish, probably not, but maybe later on when you've got a rich ecosystem down there, you could bring in the same kinds of things that exist in that ecosystem. So uh, until we actually get an orbiter there, get a lander there, get into the water and find out what's going on, we just don't know. Jamie Sleeman, would it kill you to use miles once in a while? Okay, this is like a borderline religious discussion at this point. So first, I'm Canadian, we use the metric system. I, I, was, I was raised on the metric system and that's all I understand. But that's not true, right? That's, that's the party line. But the reality is, is that, man, like, okay, so my car goes kilometers per hour, my odometer is in kilometers, but when I buy apples at the store, they're in pounds. But if I tell you, um, if you tell me temperature, I only think in Celsius. I can't imagine Fahrenheit. My wife's American. She's like, oh, it's 70 degrees. And like, I don't know what that means. Is it, is that warm? Is that cold? Apparently it's nice, but I don't know. hundred degrees is a lot. Anyway, so the point is uh, we buy our uh, sliced cheese per hundred grams, but sometimes we buy other stuff by the pound. Uh, we're messed up is what I'm saying here in Canada. And so I, you know, but the rest of the world is mostly metric. And so I try to be a good metrically raised boy and use the metric system. But at that time, at, but at the same time, I appreciate the fact that the vast majority of my viewers are in the United States and in the UK. And, and so a lot of them still use the imperial system. So I will try to remember to use both sizes, you know, both methods when I say something. So it's so-and-so miles and so-and-so kilometers. But then I also will forget and I apologize in advance. And sometimes it just doesn't sound good to go like this and then that and then this and then that and just keep doing it. Maybe we could put like some text up on the screen that shows the, the imperial version of it so that, so that helps the folks there. Uh, and I hope that by listening to us use these, these measurements, the folks who have only learned Imperial, like the United States, will get a, you'll become bilingual in the different measurement systems of the world. So uh, I think I think that's what we'll do from here on out. I'll talk to Chad. Anyway, thanks. And uh, we'll bring you over to the metric system. Jorge Julius Morales. Hello, Mr. Kane. Could an observatory be built on the moon? Would there be any advantages to that? What about making one in Antarctica? I'm gonna start with the Antarctica question first. Antarctica actually has a bunch of observatories already. In fact, one of the observatories that assisted with the Event Horizon Telescope, taking the first picture of a black hole's event horizon, is located in Antarctica. And the whole problem why we can't see these pictures yet is because they took the pictures during uh, the Antarctic uh, winter, and we have to wait for Antarctica's summer to be able to get the data off of Antarctica so that we can combine that. We, by we, I mean the radio astronomers that took the picture can combine it together to produce this image. And so, but there are tons of actually telescopes and really interesting instruments that are located in Antarctica. And maybe I'll do a video on that at some point. Anyway, could we do one on the moon? Absolutely, right? The moon is a great place. If you get on the far side of the moon, you can build a radio telescope that is, that is completely blocked off from all the radio emissions of Earth and be able to you know, listen with tremendous sort of sensitivity. Uh, but also there are some really great ideas about like taking a crater and, and building a, a nice big mirror within the crater. You can produce a really big, big telescope mirror in that low gravity. And so you wouldn't get the kind of deformations that happen here on Earth. So the moon is a great place to build a big observatory. The problem is, is that it's the moon, which is really far away. And we've just barely been able to set foot on the moon, not to mention building some kind of large telescope there. But in the future, one of the plans that a lot of people said is let's build a telescope on the moon. And I think that would be a wonderful idea. We just need to get back to the moon first. Dole biscuit. My idea build a giant space vacuum cleaner, suck up about 50% of the Venusian atmosphere, and then fly the vacuum cleaner to Mars and dump that atmosphere there. Two birds, one vacuum. Thank me later, future space colonists. You're absolutely right that what Venus has is what Mars needs, right? You take the atmosphere of Venus and you give it to Mars. You increase the thickness and density of the atmosphere on Mars. You warm it up, make it a better place to live on. And Venus, you make it a less 
terrible place to live on. The problem is, is that all that atmosphere is down in the gravity well of Venus, and it would be really hard and really expensive to get it up into space and over to Mars. The easier solution is you just take asteroids or comets, which are already in space, and you just smash them into Mars and get the atmosphere going. So it's like, I mean, I'm sure this was just a joke, but uh, it's just like getting things out of gravity wells in the solar system is the worst. Right? We sh will eventually get to a place where we are mining metals and ices and things out of asteroids, and we're just going to leave it in space because we don't want to bring them back to Earth. We don't want to keep having to take things up into space. We should be doing the minimum amount of launches to build a space infrastructure and then stop, apart from sending humans up, we really need to stop trying to take carry things from planet Earth up into space. So same problem with trying to carry things from Venus up into space. It's just as awful as, as Earth in terms of gravity well. Guy Sperry, if EBLM J05555-57AB is smaller and cooler than Jupiter, why is it considered a star? I think you're talking about this recent uh, star that was discovered, kind of the smallest star ever, and it's actually sm the size of Saturn. Why is it considered a star? Well, it's about the mass, not the size. That Jupiter is actually about as big as gas giants get, and if they get more massive, they actually start to compress because that mass starts to pull them more and more inward. And in this case, you've got a star that has um, the mass of a red dwarf, in other words, the minimum mass to start fusing hydrogen into helium in its core, but its total size is as small as Saturn, and that's sort of the minimum possible size that you can get. So it's a pretty exciting thing to find a star this small, and these are these red dwarf stars, they're the longest living stars will have in the universe. These will last for trillions and trillions of years, like 10 trillion years, which is pretty cool um, to think about things lasting that long when our own sun will only last for a few more billion years. Richard Hayes, rocks hitting you at the speed of light. It's not what the deflector dish on the Starship Enterprise is for. We could just use one of those. In reality, I read a book once, Song of Distant Earth, if I recall correctly, uh, where a b big block of ice was positioned in front of the craft to absorb any space dust impacts. I haven't read that book, but the idea is great, right? Which is that you take a big chunk of ice, you put it at the front of your spacecraft, and then you just fly through space as fast as you can, and any debris hits the block of ice, gets absorbed, ablates your armor, but it doesn't actually hit the spacecraft. By, you know, put your spacecraft inside the ice. And, and that's a great idea. And the reality is, is that water is going to be one of the most useful resources that we can get our hands on once we get to space. That we're going to use it for, bre for breathing, because we're going to split it up in hydrogen and oxygen. We're going to use it for fuel. We're going to use it for drinking. And it forms one of the best radiation shielding that we can possibly get our hands on. So we really, really want to use ice. And this is just another reason why we need to get our hands on ice in space. Colas team. The SpaceX crowd seems to be nearly fanatical. They're very annoying with how much blind faith they seem to put on that company. I'm a huge SpaceX fan. Uh, and I can understand that people had a certain amount of uh, skepticism about the claims that SpaceX made but they are landing rockets and reusing them, right? Like a thing that used to be considered impossible and nobody bothered to work on this, they are now doing. They have landed, was it, by the time you've watched this, seven, eight, nine rockets. They're about to launch the Falcon Heavy, which is like three rockets, and they're all gonna come back down and land, and then they've reused them and they're gonna shorten the reuse time. So, so I think that that people are excited about SpaceX because for the first time we feel this genuine hope and excitement that that access to space is going to get significantly cheaper and when you have significantly cheaper access to space you have only possibilities you don't know what it's going to get used for but if spaceflight is one fifth one tenth the price then things that used to be impossible to put into space or just were cost prohibitive now become possible and for those of us who feel that sort of humanity's future is to live in space and to colonize the solar system this brings it that much closer so i totally get why people are so excited about 
about SpaceX. And now a lot of people say like, well, SpaceX is, um, you know, like it wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the government. And, and I don't think that's, you know, or that, that SpaceX, sorry, they, people say that SpaceX should be doing, that there's no point to NASA and that it should all be SpaceX. And that's like the, I don't get that point, right? Like that, that there are certain, SpaceX has a certain goal to send humans to Mars. And they're gonna do everything they can to maximize that goal. And there's a bunch of things that they could do that just don't make sense. They also totally require NASA. They, NASA is one of their main customers. The first launches came from SpaceX. Um, the first launches of SpaceX came from NASA. They're a big customer. And over time, you could see that that SpaceX is going to provide more and more launches to NASA. And that's great because that means we just get to have more space telescopes, more robotic missions, more human missions, more of everything, right? And I still think there's a place for, for NASA and these kinds of, of government agencies. And that is to, to help figure out the things that are too complicated, too expensive, too dangerous for private companies, even like SpaceX, to be willing to figure out new methods of propulsion, uh, you know, nuclear rockets, um, things like that. So I think there will always be a place for the government and for things like NASA to try and keep, keep uh, wherever private companies fear to go, I think that's where places like NASA should be in there trying to help solve the problems, reduce the risk, and then hand over the technology to the private industry to figure that out. But that's fine. So, you know, why are they so fanatical? Because it's super exciting. Oh my God, rocket's landing. Come on. Are you dead inside? That's awesome. Uh, at the same time, uh, I can get why people think that the, the fans are too fanatical. But, you know, it, it feels like things are changing and we're finally getting that that sort of space exploration Christmas that we'd always wanted. And that's why I think people are so excited about it. All right, here we are, end of another question show. Thanks everyone for sending in your questions. I really appreciate it. As always, wherever you are on my channel, uh, just put in your question, whether it's about the video or anything you like, I will gather them up and answer them here. Now, as always, time for a playlist of stuff that I'm watching right now.